Actually, we'll go back to Isaiah 58, 12. This is God's Spirit. Isaiah 58, 12. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repair of the breach, the restore of the past to dwell in. Let's open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your truth. Father, may you edify us and may we be as you would have us to be in these days of deceit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. God is the righteous way to live and walk and talk and breathe and everybody would prosper and everybody would be blessed and the world be filled with joy and peace but we got to do it God's way wolves and hirelings think such honor and gain is godliness and God's blessing when it is the testing of their character when you're given an opportunity to take advantage of somebody that's not God blessing you that's God testing you if you take advantage of somebody in their weakness you are of the devil the devil's a murderer now let me just use an example and maybe the Lord had her make that little mistake this young lady's been playing, playing for us faithfully and very well and she made a little mistake. Now, a wolf, if there's somebody in this church that envied her and wanted her position and wanted the glory of it, they'd say, see, she's not that good. She must not be dedicated. She must not be practicing. She must, they'll run her down. The Bible says the devil is the accuser of the brethren. And why would they do that? To gain her glory, to take her position. Such as wolves. Wolves are devouring creatures. They prey upon the weak. They eat the slower, the ones that can't get away from the weaker ones. God doesn't want you or I to be a wolf. He wants us to be a restorer of the past to dwell in. That's what God wants from his people. Wolves and hirelings think such honor and gain is godliness and God's blessing when it's their testing. Today, when Christians hop from church to church, people think God's blessing them. Oh, God's sending me their folks because he's no good and I'm an inner city preacher. When in fact, God's testing their character. You see, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. As the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that gathereth uh, riches, getteth riches, and watch that, and not by right, shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool. You see, you can get riches, but you've got to get them by right. You can't get them by wrong. You can't be an opportunist. Now, if an opportunity is given to you in legitimacy, take that opportunity. And the Bible says, I've set before thee an open door. If God gives an open door, don't be afraid to go through it. But don't prey on somebody else's mishaps. That's the sign of a wolf. Don't prey on somebody else's weaknesses. That's the sign of a wolf. Christians are to help people and enable people. Satan has been the evil redistribution of wealth for centuries. However, the Lord will redistribute wealth righteously at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, the righteous. Look at Exodus chapter 22, 1. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. Now, perchance, any of those hideous creatures on television proclaiming a false gospel and the false ways of God to suck people's money away, if any of those hideous creatures should be saved, 
they're going to have to give back all the members that they took by fraudulent means. In other words, in eternity, these big time preachers, if any of them should be saved, and most of them aren't, are going to be the poorest people in eternity. Because they were wolves. They took on the characteristics and trait of a wolf. The labor, the Bible says, is worthy of his reward. Now, you talk about evil. So here's this man, envy, works hard all his life. I don't care whether he's saved or lost. Earns his wealth by righteousness. And now people are trying to take it from him. And the government's going to be an accomplice to this. Hell's going to be filled, and they deserve it. There's a scripture verse where the Lord said, Thou consentest with a thief. Thou thoughtest I was altogether such a one as thyself, and I will reprove thee. Now, there's two things about honest work. It's good for you. Just don't do too much of it, because you become a thief again. In other words, you have to have a balance for God first, your family, and your work. Now, hypothetically, I'll give you the 40-hour work week. That gives you time on Sunday to be with God and your family and some time for rest and family on Saturday. You have to work overtime. Try to work your overtime during the week. But don't work too much because the plowing of the wicked is sin. And don't work too little because God doesn't bless a thief and a lazy man. The Bible says, let your moderation be known amongst all men. That's a balanced life of righteousness. It's a narrow walk. It's being responsible. Responsible to your calling. Responsible to your creator. Responsible to your family, responsible to your community, being responsible. The labor is worthy of his reward, not the raper, the taker, the faker, and the heartbreaker, who is worthy of his judgment and his loss, and he will receive it if he's saved and operates as a wolf. As it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Now, what people want all the time, and God in his grace is giving people time to repent, time to have their eyes open, time to change. They want instant justice. Well, God isn't McDonald's, but God is going to bring justice. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Hellfire and damnation awaits the unregenerated and lost soul. Shame and nakedness awaits the saint unconformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Great and eternal rewards with the praise of God are for those regenerated and conformed to his image. For God is just and holy. Hebrews 3.7 Wherefore the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, a minister of the gospel should be preaching and teaching the word of God, not Aesop's fairy tales. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Now there's no way in the world that Christians not reading their Bible and preachers not preaching the scriptures, there's no way in the world that Christians can know God's ways. Somebody's got to get into that book. The minister's got to be teaching it and preaching it. Or you're supposed to be reading it. It's supposed to be a combination of both. It's supposed to be the preacher preaches and teaches it, and then we go home and search it to see if these things are so. That's the way it's supposed to be. 
Wherefore I was grieved with that generation. They do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. God does not operate as a thief. God does not operate as a liar. God does not operate in any of those things that you find his law forbids. He's holy. He's not like us. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort, now there, I'm encouraging you, encourage one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin deceives. Lust deceives. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. One of the greatest deceptions is drugs. Drugs deceive. People are in pain. They take a drug to relieve the pain. Drugs, booze. My heart aches. They get a momentary flash of euphoria and then tremendous misery and more. And it takes more drugs to give you the euphoria and then more depression afterwards as it sucks the joy and the peace out of you, making you miserable. It deceives you. Such is the way of all sin. When you go to the crown before the cross, you're going to be at loss sooner or later. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. As there are also life callings that we must assume are of God, which often transfer Christians to other locations on the earth, let us pray they are all led of the spirit of Jesus Christ and not the spirit of this world, as Demas, but as Tychius sent to Euphius. For Demas has forsaken me. Now, you get these individuals that can't stand the fact that God has tremendous character and righteousness. God saves losers. God saves sinners. <laughs> For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There isn't a person that isn't saved that wasn't a sinner. So you have this fellow Demas who God forgave and then Demas, like many, forsook God because he loved this present world and he departed into Thessalonica, Acrisius to Galatia. Now see, some of these other fellows were going out to serve God. Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Luke's being faithful. Take Mark and bring him with thee for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Mark's being faithful. In Tychius have I sent to Euphius. But I'll tell you this, anybody with discerning spirit, you just need to find out why a person's doing it. Most of the things people are doing, uh, most of the folks that have gone out of this church, supposedly gone to ministry, they were running from God. They just wanted to make it sound good. However, church membership should not be changed for light and transient reasons. You know why people leave? because they don't want to deal with the issues. They don't want to deal with the sin. Well, if I don't take my drugs, I'll feel my pain, and I gotta keep taking my prescription drugs even though I'm abusing them, and that pastor can't love me because it hurts me every time he talks about that. It makes me feel so wicked. Yeah. That's why members have left our church. They're drug abusers, prescription drug abusers. I'm not their enemy. I'm trying to help them. It's a wonderful life when you live a clean life. I've been saved since I was 24. No drugs, no booze, no problems, no pains in that manner. It's a good life. Reality is not that bad. The, my son and my wife, we went up... In, in her condition, I put my wife on the Superman. We went out and we buckled her in. They have a seat belt and everything. 
We went, whoa, what a ride, man. You come over that thing. You know, we had a wonderful day at Darien Lake. God bless. It was like 72 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. We rode all the rides, had a great time, ate some good fattening food. I mean, dough and, dough and go, man. Fried dough and go. Had a wonderful time. I didn't steal from God on a Sunday. Mm -mm. God blesses. In his time, he hath made everything beautiful in his time and in his way. However, church membership should not be changed for light and transient reasons. Accordingly, all experience and revelation of Scripture has shown it is God's will that we learn to suffer for him in righteousness, true and faithfulness, when we are called upon as the Lord himself laid down his life, which was necessary for the righteousness, truth, and godliness in our redemption of his cross. All right, take your Bible here, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. If you're going to be in the ministry, you're going to get hurt. I get hurt often. And it hurts. Sometimes it hurts tremendously. I have to ask God to heal me. If you're going to serve God, you're going to get hurt. But you're going to get hurt worse in the world. You want to talk about being hurt. Ladies, can I speak to you with compassion, especially young ladies. God gives you a gift of a certain amount of beauty. Some selfish, self-centered, self-gratifying man looks at your beauty and says, I want that. And he wants to receive pleasure from you and your body. And he seduces you and impregnates you and abandons you. You talk about hurt. You talk about being really hurt. For the next 20 years, you've got to take care of that child and raise that child and feed that child. And you're not supposed to be working in the workforce. You're supposed to be in the home raising the child. But you've got to go to the workforce. What a betrayal. What a, what a greedy, selfish. You know what I think you ought to do to men like that? I think you ought to try them and convict them and execute them. What wicked, selfish, self-centered, self-seeking, self-glorifying rats. God never intended that. God intended you to get a husband that married you and stuck with you through thickness and thin, for better and for worse, till death you do part. A man that would suffer with you and joy with you. And you know what love is? Sacrifice for you. Husbands, love your wives as Christ so loved the church and gave himself for it. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now, you want to understand the ministry? And I accept it. Sometimes it's a little hard to endure it. All I do is go out and tell people how to get saved, encourage people to trust Christ, and then three times a week I tell people how to live right, truthfully, and glorify God, and encourage them to do the right thing, and witness for the Lord. And they get mad at me for telling them the truth. And then they try to hurt me because I told them the truth. Because I won't consent to them in untruth. It's like, he's hurting me when he talks about drug addiction and drug abuse. He has to stop that because I can't handle that. I, can't, I, I, I have to have my drugs. He's hurting me when he preaches against 
alcohol uh, uh, use because I got to have my booze. He's hurting me when he preaches against my sin because I got to have my sin because without my sin, you poor thing. I'm going out that door. I got to have my sin. No, you need your Savior. So I understand, ladies. I know what it's like to be raped. I wouldn't let a man rape you. I wouldn't rape a woman. I'm not that vile. But I'm a sinner saved by grace. But rejoice in so much of your partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory should be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you reproach for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Been married to that lady back there? I've had opportunities over the 34 years. There have been women that would, be, would have been happy to fornicate with me. Human lust, everybody wants to fornicate. You're supposed to crucify it. I'm not knowing another woman, but that woman, that's the only woman I'm going to know unless she dies and I remarry. So that's called character. That's Christ's character. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Character is faithfulness. You're supposed to crucify your lusts. You realize how many pastors? You know, I know why Bev and Jim liked me? Because they had several pastors that ran off with women. So they finally found a pastor that didn't run off with a woman. But you know, there's church members of this church, people that left this church, that don't like me because I wouldn't run off with a woman. Hell had no fury as a woman scorned. You know, you behave, gentlemen, like Joseph and the witch, the witch will be after you. You remember what happened to Joseph? When Joseph kept his purity and Joseph honored God and Joseph wouldn't defile Potiphar, the witch tried to kill him. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. It does. Church hoppers are people that are rejected of God, not people that are justified. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of, be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner of prayer? Scriptures reveal that mankind is much more ennobled to suffer while evils are sufferable than to attempt to right themselves by abolishing the forms of ministration to which they are accustomed. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Servants. Be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now, I was blessed in my working days. I had a lot of uh, bosses, and I can only remember two or three of them that were unbearable, and one of them got fired. And one of them changed. And I don't know what happened to the other one. But I didn't quit my job because my boss was a jerk. 
But I'll tell you what, I thank God for all those good bosses that treated me right. I was appreciative of them. You know what? I gave them labor. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted? That's the way you want to be, folks. Now you take Ron there. I know this about Ron. Ron's a hard worker. Aren't you, Ron? I'll say it for you, though. Let me say it. Let another man praise thee. That's a good thing, Ron. That's the way a man's supposed to be. You have some good bosses? Take good care of you? Yeah, that's a good, righteous trade. You give them good labor, they give you a... That's good, Ron. God blessed you for that, didn't he? You got a good family. Same with you, Dan. You got a good wife. Real articulate. Amen. For what glory is it when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. Not all of those bosses were always good to you, were they? This is acceptable with God. Had to go home and tell the wife it wasn't a good day on the job. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Amen. But you have your food and your aiming. You have your house. What are legitimate reasons for Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ for leaving the church? Very few. See 1 John 3.14. Oh, look at this one. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Mm -mm. You know what Christ did? He died for us. When is the right time to leave a church? Not often. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against scriptural wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take on you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to uh, withstand an evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having not... There, oh, 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 oh! Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, Wherewith ye should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Absolutely never without the clear leading of the Holy Spirit in the sound doctrine, in the truth of the Scriptures, and the scriptural principles of his word. You say, why is that? Because the Bible says, now the just shall live by faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You cannot live by faith if you're not hearing God's word. Boy, people think faith is all kinds of things. People think faith is jumping off, um, off a pinnacle of a temple. Jesus Christ refused to do that. He said, it was written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I'll tell you, they got the darndest things for faith. You've got preachers that will criticize you for working, honestly, when your church is small, and say you're not living by faith because you're not living by welfare. You know what I had a preacher say one time I couldn't believe it but boy I've learned to believe a lot of things this guy got up in the pulpit and was criticizing preachers for not living by faith in other words quit your job I mean I think there's time and place for Christ for pastors to do that and certainly a pastor that has a church that's large enough shouldn't be working he should be feeding the flock 
But it's amazing how the Apostle Paul made tents through most of his ministry. I think he had greater faith than most men. It's just amazing how people don't read their Bible, do they? Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Most who draw back deceive themselves to believing it is the church that's in error, when in reality it's them who are in error. Many Christians leave because they are out of harmony with the church's biblical position as they allow the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Got to get mine. Got to get mine. Man's got to make a living. I'm okay, preacher. I'm okay. Got to make a living, you know. And the lust of other things. I need it. Got to have it. Got to have it. I need it. If I don't get it, I'm going to die. You will soon enough. To gradually move them back to the world where they become unfruitful. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. A major catalyst for changing convictions is the presence of teenage worldlings in the home. It is easier to surrender to teenage worldlings than it is to change them through prayer, fasting, discipline, and being an example of holy virtue to them. For even here too were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow in his steps. Are you a Christian? You're supposed to be, all Christians are supposed to be following in Christ's steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Rather than admit failure, and repent, many parents often adjust their convictions and adapt the new reality, forgetting the curse of God on the children of God's people. I'll tell you what's going to be one of the most devastating times at the great white throne judgment is when many saved Christians watch their children go to hell. And their, their children could have easily been saved had they been right with God when their kids were young. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. That's the knowledge of God, folks. I will reject thee. So they hop from church to church that thou shalt be no priest to me. God won't have you. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. There's a whole group of Christians that are saved. Most Calvinists are saved. And the children of most all Calvinists are going to hell because they have taken the intellectual thought and twisted God's words so that they don't have to serve God. And they curse their children to hell. You might well be saved, but your children could reap hell for your lightness in the word, work, and will of God. And that's happening big time today. You know, people say, Billy Sunday was a great revival preacher. Really? Billy Sunday died. Before he died, he came to the realization that not one of his kids got saved. Maybe he wasn't such a great revival preacher. You know, picking grapes is a lot more fun than plowing. I'd much rather pick fruit than uh, plow. And there's been a lot of ministers that went to fruit picking without plowing. Do you understand what I'm saying? And they lost their own. You know, the real mark of evangelist is not how much fruit he picks, but the condition he leaves the vineyard in. If you destroy the vineyard to get your fruit, you're a fool. You know, in the Old Testament, the Jew was told not to cut down fruit trees. Looking diligent, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, this is the stage we're in. 
This country is a defiled country. Read the Old Testament where God told them to execute murderers, to do justice, lest the land be defiled. You're living in a defiled land. This was once a virtuous nation. It is a defiled nation. It is not godly. It is just pretending to be. Even its generosity is by stealing from the rich. It's not giving of its own. Giving is giving of your own, not taking from another and transferring the wealth. Roots of bitterness rise in the heart of pride as it believes that it did not receive what it should receive. Such was the dissatisfied prodigal son, which is not Jesus Christ nor God's way. You see, the son didn't think he got his fair share. You know, most Americans today, especially the poor, who couldn't get their fair share because they were too lazy and too wicked, think that they're old something. They are. They are. They're old. They, God owes them an eternal damnation, and he's going to give it to them. You want to be careful what you think you're owed. I'm telling you, you want to embrace this thought. I'm doing better than I deserve. Thou hast not chastened us after our iniquities. A root of bitterness. Now, that's what's destroyed a lot of ministers. Because... They start off good, same thing with politicians, to do the right thing, and then they get raped, and then they come to the conclusion that they have to rape gently. You're not to rape anybody, anytime, for anything, for any reason. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. I'm not going to rape another church because my church has been raped three times. Two wrongs never made one right. Hebrews 7.26, here's God. Here's God's way. For such a high priest became us, what's the first thing Jesus Christ is? Holy. What's the second thing is? Harmless. What's the third thing is undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Two wrongs never make one right. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man should do unto me. Perfect love casts out fear, for fear hath torment. Loving the Lord Jesus Christ will rid you of the fear that will corrupt you in life. Loving the Lord Jesus Christ will rid you of the fear that will corrupt you. Now, I can be an example to you. I had shortly, a while ago, a church of 50 folks, and now have a church of 20. Spiritually, times are tough. And the devil comes in and says, well, you're just going to fail. And I tell the Lord and the devil, well, if I've got to fail, I'm going to fail righteously. I'm not going to fear what man should do unto me. I'm going to be faithful in season, out of season. I'm going to stick by the stuff. I'm going to trust God because verily thou shalt be fed. And boy, I have not yet gotten slim yet in my life because God has just been so good to me. Hello? I'm going out visiting next Saturday and the Saturday after that and the Saturday after that. And I'm going to preach and teach. If you all leave, I don't have to build a building. I'm going to keep going until the Lord rebuilds it. 
if you all stay in time, the Lord will add to us. And some will come and some will go. But I'm sticking with God. So why is that? He's taking care of me. He'll take care of you. See, let your conversation be without covetousness. I don't need to be the biggest church in the world. And be content with such things as you have. You guys, you guys, I'm content with you. I think you're some good folks. You're good enough for me. I don't need any more. She's playing real fine. You're doing a good job back there. Going to have the dinner prepared. Bonnie's doing a great job. I'm happy. Taking care of the books, doing a good job. I'm happy with what I got. If the Lord adds to it, glory to God. Are you happy with what you got? You say, well, you're not the best looking preacher. No. You're not the sharpest arrow in the quiver. No. Well, what do you got going for you? I'm faithful. That may not be much, but that much I am. I proved it. Today, let's look at seven non-scriptural and very humanistic reasons for leaving the church, contrary to the revelation of God's word and the leading of the Holy Spirit, which would have us to stay, pray, and display his faithfulness in your sacrificial walk in the spirit of godliness and righteousness. First, when gross sin is revealed. Someone has sinned in an open, notorious, and capital transgression of the law. Well, how did Apostle Paul handle it? 1 Corinthians 5.1. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. There's that sexual predator again. This guy is so immoral, he's had a relationship with his father's wife. We have to assume that it's not incestual, but it's a second wife or something after the death of his mother. I hope it ain't that depraved doesn't tell us. Man, I mean, you talk about being selfish, depraved. There was gross, his own father, there was gross sin, or was he being vengeful to his father? There was gross sin in the, you talk about a lack of character. There was gross sin in the church of Corneth, but Paul, through the Holy Spirit, commanded the church to deal with the sinning member and not for the saints to leave the church. Look at 1 Timothy 1.5. Now the end of the commandment is charity of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith on fame, from which some have swerved, having turned aside unto vain janglings, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know the law is good if a man use it lawfully. You know what the problem with men is today? They, they like to use the law to harm and hurt people rather than to correct and instruct people. The law was made for the ungodly and for sinners, and it was made to correct them. You see how somebody used the law? Like the young lady was playing the piano and she made some mistakes. So, see, a holier-than-thou person that would want to take her position from her and she's probably safe now while the church is small, but let the church get up to uh, 50 or 60 folks again, and then you might be in danger. But your faithful pastor will keep his faithful pianist. Because you were faithful when the glory wasn't here. You'll be more than faithful when the glory returns. So they'd use law. Well, she's not very skilled. She's not very good. No, she just had a bad minute or two. In fact, most of the time I've heard her play, it's always been very good. I'm happy with you. I don't need the prima donnas. I need faithful people true people, godly people. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. 
Knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. If there be anything that is contrary to sound doctrine, notice all the things that talk about sound doctrine today. How can you talk about sound doctrine by stealing other people's members? How can you talk about uh, being uh, sound doctrine, being a whoremonger? How can, how can you talk about sound doctrine defiling yourselves with mankind? How can you talk about sound doctrine being a liar or a perjured person? Those things are all contrary to sound doctrine. You know what's bogus today in the church? is ridiculous. The, a person doesn't have his eschatology down correctly. And it's, well, his doctrine, he's, he's corrupt. But they don't worry about anybody's righteousness, their conduct. It is dreadful. Sound doctrine deals with a holy walk. It is not for the godly to leave the church in the case of sin. However, it might be the ungodly sinner who would have a need to depart or be cast out. 1 Corinthians 5.2 And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now, there's something wrong with churches that try to hang on to people that only want to be wicked and don't want to get right. The whole purpose of being here is to learn righteousness. You don't want to learn righteousness I'm not trying to keep you here. You want to walk with God, this is the place to be. You want to walk with the devil, this is not the right place for you. And I'm not trying to keep you. For verily, as absent in body, be present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul said, throw that fellow out. Let the devil have him. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveth the whole lump? You leave a creep like that in the, in, in, in the church, the body of Christ, and he's going to corrupt it. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the face not with old leaven, that's the ways of the world, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, that's the ways of the world, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. When the Apostle Paul bids the saints to come out from among them, he was talking about the world, not the church. It is not God's will that the sinner leave the church, but that he should come to repentance and righteousness, humbling himself in the pride of his lust to walk in the spirit of holiness and righteousness. Okay, so what I need from you, just to be using you as the illustration there today, you got to tell me, well, pastor, I'm going to practice so I won't make that mistake again. See? Amen. See, that's what, it, that's, that's what Christians do. You're appreciated very much. And you know what? If you make a mistake from time to time, we're going to give you grace. Because faithful Christians are needed. And faithful Christians are appreciated. We should seek to respond to our sinning brothers and sisters with restoration through repentance, not amputation. Amputation should only occur after the whole church should decide to amputate after a failure in true repentance and restoration. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. The case of the cross was to save men's lives, not to destroy them. Look at what Jesus had to tell his disciples. And they did not receive him because his face was as though to go to Jerusalem. The cross the crucifixion, the sacrificing for others. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou 
that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit you are of. Remember, Job, whose spirit came from you? For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. However, the church should not fear to cast out a reproved, unrepentant scorner. Cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Have you noticed it's been awful peaceful in this church lately? Has there been any contentions lately? Anybody had a problem with their brother or sister lately? Anybody been fighting over anything lately? I don't think so. Nothing to fight over, is there? We just go out and witness, and we learn from the Lord. Satan is a raper, a taker, a faker, a heartbreaker. The heart of hell is that of a murderer and a liar, not abiding the truth. Jesus told the people, you are of your father the devil, and lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and bold not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. The heart of heaven is that of a redeemer and a life giver. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. See, he came to sacrifice and give. The way of the cross leads home. There's a good song. The way of the cross leads home. The thief, he comes to get his. He got to have it. He needs it. He's consumed with his lust. Ye war. Ye war. Why do you war? Because you consume it on your lust. The abundant life of peace only comes through peace with God. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Never in the history of the world has a second wrong made one right. Brethren, if a man be taken over in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. I say there's a lot of deceived Christians today. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let all, let, excuse me, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. The only one that should leave the church or be put out is the Christian that brings the world's ways and sin into the congregation of God without a true repentance upon the revelation of a sin. To not be teachable is to not be edified in Christ and hopeless. You see, people need to come to church to learn and be teachable. I wrote unto you an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with covetousness, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. That was one of the other problems we had. We had a pastor that was inviting the members of this church to his church for Sunday services to come up and spend the weekend. Started off with this so-called camp, which you're all aware of, that was only to occur once a year, and then on a winter time he sends me an email where he's got six different events and he's inviting my people to go up there and spend the weekend. I say that's a wolf. I say that's a selfish immoral man. He told me while well, it was covetousness. I was like, okay, then what? You got liberty to be covetous? How come you got it and I don't? Christians belong in their own church on Sunday. If you don't take care of your own church, who will? Obviously not those that left it. Who will care about it? Obviously not those that leave it. Who will do right by it? Obviously not those that fornicate with all the other churches. Hey, you got plenty of time to go to the revivals and other things. And yes, if you, if you through the Holy Spirit, you know, the Lord says you ought to go to this revival for your vacation and you decide to take off for a weekend and, and gone that's fine and good 
But, I mean, what? Every time another minister invites you to their church, you're supposed to go there, you go to his church six times, you go to this brother six times, you go to that brother five times. Uh, whatever happened to your church? I like the guy said, well, you ought to make an exception just on, uh, uh, just once. It's just once, once every year. Yeah, I wasn't born yesterday. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And I know when the step starts going the wrong way. I've been in the ministry a long time. I not, don't want to do it, not going to do it. Fornicators. What I've written on, people that have lust, they think the only purpose to go to church is to get aroused and excited. No, you need to get humbled and instructed. Somebody is missing it today. But now I've written on to you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother or fornicator, or covetous or idolater or a rallier or a drunkard or extortioner with with such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judges. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Maybe it was an elder. Is this a good reason to leave? No, God. And the scriptures have a process for all members of a local church. This has never happened in this church. I want all of you to pay attention to this. This is, this is God's way. Uh, but, boy, you've heard a lot of bad things about this pastor over the years. Haven't, now, haven't you heard things about me that I'm wrong in this and wrong in that? Have, have you heard that? Come on, you must have heard somebody. Say, well, here's, what you, here's the way it's supposed to be done. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth... Excuse me. Um, one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear, the, hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, and it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Now, that's the way you need to deal with your brothers. That's not the way you deal with an elder. You see, you need to understand something. First, a trespass is not an offending. A trespass is a violation of another's rights. It is to violate any rule of prosititude or to injure another. Offended. The world offends me. Offended. And you pass gas, that's offending. <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding. That's offending. That's not sin, but it's very offending. A trespass is when somebody steps on your toes. Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Children often believe, children often believe, because they are offended at something, it is not right, when often they are not right. Now, going way back, I had this young lady. She looked like a movie star. She came to our church. And I had no idea. I mean, I thought she was a happily married woman. And one day the Lord said, preach on adultery. And I started preaching on adultery. I just thought it was a general preaching to teach people and lo and behold, she got offended. And she went around telling everybody in the church, he's preaching right at me, because she was offended. And he's not fit to be a pastor. I had a guy come to me and say, you know, shouldn't, you know, what's the big deal? <laughs> yeah. I think there's a big deal in that, you know? I mean, wait till your wife commits adultery. <laughs> You'll find out it's a big deal. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye uh, so even to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The church is the whole body of Jesus Christ in the local assembly. 
to hear the issue of a trespass and decide the spirit of justice of God's word, the truth and consequences of the case before. No one is supposed to be making judgments on other people. Judge not lest you be judged. No one is supposed to be judge and jury. If there's really a sin in the church, you go privately to them individually, you take a second individual with them, and then it goes before the whole church if it's something that should be judged. Like extreme fornication, okay? I mean, you don't judge somebody for having long hair. We'll get into that. Dare any of you have a matter against another? Go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Now, who's the saints? You're all the saints, the church, the body. God doesn't have any confidence in your individual judgments, but he says we have to put our confidence in the whole body's judgment. That's why when you, in law, you have a jury of 12, your peers, nobody goes to jail. Listen to me. Nobody goes to jail in this country because one person thinks another person's bad. Before you put somebody in jail, you have to go through due process and they have to take the evidence before a group of their peers, 12 members. There were 12 apostles and have them all agree that that person was bad. Agree. 100%. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that should be able to judge between his brethren, but brother go to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? There. Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Grow up. Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren, with a more stringent responsibility for the discipline of an elder. Now, here, see, with an elder, and that'd be the pastor, obviously, and others, because of their job, especially the pastor, who preaches and teaches God's word and people get mad at it all the time and people attack him all the time because of the teaching of the word. You're not supposed to have one person do it, you see. Against an elder receive not an accusation but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all that others may also fear. Now that's not this witness that while well, two years ago I saw the pastor do this and three years ago I saw the pastor do this and Ten years ago, the pastor did this. No, that is, the two of us saw the pastor do this last week. The three of us saw the pastor do this two days ago. And then, as the chief elder, a pastor is to be subject to the whole church congregation, and not to prideful, self-willed deacons, whose ministry is to serve the congregation and not subject the pastor to the pride and, uh, and not subject the pastor to their pride and control. No, nor do the sheep shepherd the shepherds. See? The Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. You see, if a pastor or an elder does something wrong, you've got to have a couple witnesses that saw it. And then they follow that procedure and they go see the pastor and they look for his repentance. And if he repents, then he should, like anybody else, be forgiven. And if he doesn't, then you take it before the whole church. Now, before everybody left, you all were contacted at the church meeting, yes? You guys got a contact of the church meeting to discuss my failures in the ministry. You all did, didn't you? And that the whole church was going to come together and examine the pastor's conduct. You did get that because that's God's way of doing it. And then your pastor stood before you and the charges were brought and they were proven to be true or non-true. That didn't occur. 
I don't think anybody's reading the Bible. Oh, and you did have two or three people see the pastor do something of a gross sin like go out on his wife. I mean, it was something worthy of death. You, I mean, two or three people saw your pastor rob the bank, and they're going to bring it before your attention. It is not unusual for godly elders to be maligned by ungodly saints who are out of the way, and therefore a benefit of doubt should be given elders until multiple accounts surface with two or three witnesses before they are brought before the entire congregation for justice and truth, and certainly not a meeting of a fraction of prideful, self-willed mutineers in respect of persons following some man rather than God's word, some man that fell in love with himself. Matthew, it is enough for the disciple to be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? The false charges of all rebels that every minister of the gospel must endure from time to time in the ministry are found throughout scriptures. Now here's this guy named Paul. Paul was a lowly character, I guess. And this is what they said. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Where did we hear that before? Truth is despised and contemptible to falsehood and unbelief. An evil disease, say they, cleaveth fast unto him, and now that he lieth, he shall rise up no more. <laughs> now, how do you defend it? Oh, he's got STDs. Really? An evil disease. Children always cry they are not loved when withheld from their lusts. So godly pastors must understand that wicked children will always cry foul when there is no foul. Jeremiah 38, 4. Therefore the princess said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death. For thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in this city, and the hands of all the people, in speaking such words unto them. Oh, I remember this. If you keep preaching and teaching without you changing, nobody's going to come to this church because you say that homosexuality is a queer conduct. Hmm. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. I'm all in favor of homosexuals getting saved. But they're going to get saved from their sins, not in their sins. With God. Remember that if it was spoken about of your sinless Savior, how much more his servants. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they had called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Now, this is a personal thing I put on there and we'll close today. Because now we're going through things that I want to get past and we've pretty much gotten past, but we, we need to lay foundation for the future. It ain't going to change. We're going to win people and then people are going to be taught the truth and then people are going to get mad because they want to sin and they're going to want me to change so that they can sin. And, you know, here's the irony of it. If you want to sin, there's the whole world out there. Why do I have to change God's word? Why don't you just go sin? I mean, let's say you're a young, attractive woman, and you want to be an adulteress, and you want to have several affairs with several men. Uh, why do I have to stop preaching that God says it's wrong? Why don't you just go have your affairs until somebody does something horrendous? You know what Moses said? He said, I took nothing from them. Now, it's the same with them as you. You ain't a single person here I owe a dime to. There isn't a single person here I borrowed anything from. <coughs> There's not a single person in this church I hurt any time, any way. <coughs> if I did, tell me. I'll make it right. So it was with all those that departed. You know what it was? They got tired of me telling them they were wrong to do wrong.
You want to know what my associate's problem was? He wanted me to trust him. And I refused to put my trust in him because I put my trust in Christ. That offended him. Because he thinks people are supposed to trust him and that Bible says you don't put confidence in man. You give people opportunity, but you're supposed to follow God, obey my voice. Well, he proved himself real trustworthy, didn't he? The minute things didn't go right, boy, did he ever show he was a trustworthy, faithful, godly, sacrificial, caring individual, caring about the welfare of someone else. You tell them there's a judgment day coming and I'm looking forward to it. How long, O oh Lord? God will speedily avenge his folks, but we're not to avenge ourselves. Two wrongs never made a right. You know what gives me the... I have to be careful of the most root of bitterness is I never had a day in court. All these things were said and I didn't get a chance to stand before the whole congregation and say, what are you talking about? When, where, and how did I do this or that? You see, self-willed, murdering, slandering, vile credence don't look for justice they look for vengeance. That's why God said, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will pay. And then, Well, if you didn't say what you just said, we might come back. Brother or sister, you don't come back repentant. I don't want you back. I don't like being assassinated. I accept it, but I'm not seeking it. And if you don't want to live godly and do things in a godly manner and follow the scriptures, I don't need to be abused. I get a lot of it, but I don't seek it. Anybody got any questions? Because these things are important. If we're going to lay the foundation, we're going to have to go lay it again. You need to understand. It doesn't matter if it's me or any other minister in this pulpit that's trying to be faithful to God in their humanity. If they're keeping their nose clean, and I'm talking about major sins, and they might have a few shortcomings. I may not smile at every baby I should and kiss every baby I should. I don't know what I don't do right and don't do wrong. I wasn't born the greatest looking guy in the world. You know, what can I say? I'm a sinner saved by grace. Um, I hope you'll follow me in the Lord. Uh, I hope you put your trust in the Lord, not in me, but you'll see that your pastor has been faithful. I think you've been wonderful, and I think you've been faithful, and I think you should see clearly what has happened, and be ready to forgive your brothers if they would like to repent to you for taking the law into their own hands and not notifying you of the time that we'd all come together and we'd judge our pastor's ministry. You all got notified, didn't you? Did you get a notification? Did you get a notification for my the day of my judgment before the church? We're all going to come together and find out if I did anything wrong? No? Somebody dropped the ball. Did you get a notification? You were, how about you? Where was your no Did you get one? No, you just saw all these folks leave with slanders. That ain't godly. That ain't justice. Bonnie, they called you up and said, we're going to have a church meeting where the pastor will have to answer for cri high crimes and misdemeanors. No. No. A wolf, a wolf just devoured a bunch of sheep. 
Now, I am not going to devour anybody else's house because mine got devoured. Let me show you the ending of this. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he has made you, make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. This doctrine is so contrary to the doctrine of Jesus Christ that many years ago the Holy Spirit caused me to adopt a personal policy concerning situations in which members from other independent, soul-winning, Bible-believing churches indicate an interest in joining my church. The Holy Spirit showed me that I must be guided by the principle of charity and concern for the well-being of other churches of the gospel if I was in his way and walk in Jesus Christ. And the rest of it, I end it with telling people, stay in your own church. Stay in your own church and grow up. Now, what I'm concerned about, cut that. 